All right, let's go ahead and get started. So, I'm in the middle of uh, being course director for the respiratory course, so I fear I've fallen down on the job, and I don't know who to thank for tonight. So please shout out. Who should we all be thanking for both uh, hosting this and ostensibly delivering pizza for us? Dr. Ward. Uh, I didn't do that. <laughs> okay, if some other irate group shows up wondering where their pizzas are, we'll be referring them your way. So thank you, Ortho Club. And sign-up sheets in here on the pizza boxes in case anybody hasn't had a chance. Feel free to wander on down, grab some more pizza, and since the uh, die is cast on that regard, and sign in. All right, let's get going. So, last time I got quite a bit further than I expected, and we got all the way through the development of anesthesia and the really twisted story of how that came to be. So anesthesia is now a reality. Surgery is not only based firmly in an anatomic understanding of the human body, and it can be done without causing undue pain and squirming on behalf of the person receiving it, but it's still a problem. And why is surgery still problematic? Why is it something people try to avoid? Infection. So surgical infection is still a massively, massively important thing. And in fact, if you remember the story about the assistants getting their fingers amputated during the surgical um, procedures at the time, people would die from small cuts, small lacerations, small amputations, because infection was almost inevitable, because there was no understanding of germ theory, no understanding about how cleanliness might actually impact the surgical practice. So, actually to set the stage a little bit before we even talk about Joseph Lister up here, surgeons at the time not only tried their best to be quick, they almost took a perverse pride in how filthy their operating garments were. They'd have blood caked frock coats that they'd wear. It wasn't unusual for people to kind of uh, quickly strop their scalpel on the you know, leather of their shoe to kind of get a nice little hone to it before cutting in. So the entire procedure was almost designed to create surgical infection. The first real hint of antiseptic activity in surgery came with Joseph Lister. He was a Quaker, grew up in England, and trained as a surgeon, but he had a really unusual background. His father was a fairly advanced microscopist. He worked in microscopic investigations. Quakers at the time and still were encouraged to have some scientific, natural, philosophical pursuits in addition to their livelihood. And his father figured out how to fix something called chromatic ab uh, abnormalities of a lens. So when you have a general kind of a primitive microscope, the different wavelengths of light refract differently. So when you look at something, it's going to blur in kind of a rainbow way. And his father figured out how to fix that. And Joseph Lister grew up understanding how microscopes worked and brought that into his medical training and surgery. So he was looking at how inflammation happens and was looking at inflamed tissues under the microscope. And a colleague of his said that he finally caught up on his reading from the continent and had read this fascinating article by a guy named Louis Pasteur, talking about germs and how the germs were spoiling wine and beer and silkworm production in France, and that these microbes were actually the cause of it. And Lister, being able to investigate with the microscope right away, picked up on the idea that maybe some of the problems they were having in surgery were due to these little microbes. And so he started looking at these, what called bacteria, they were called animalcules, to see if there was something distinct about the different types of pus that would develop after surgery. And in general, he found that was the case. What they called laudable pus was a thick, whitish stuff. Tended, they didn't have the name for it at the time, but laudable pus we now know is due to staph, staphylococcus. And it was called laudable or praiseworthy because it doesn't tend to go central. It tends to stay where it's at, tends to take care of the infection, be relatively localized, and heal relatively well. Other times, he would find that if you had kind of a thick, nasty, smelly pus, that is due to what we now call streptococcus, so strep. And it does tend to move centrally and can actually cause death if it gets very central, gets into the blood, causes septicemia. And oftentimes, if they would amputate and you'd get that nasty pus forming, they'd have to amputate further and further and further up the limb, try to chase that infection before it spread 
too centrally and killed the person off. And last and most horrible was this watery, death-smelling pus. And that was due to clostridium. And this was gas gangrene. And this is the stuff that just stunk up the wards. Surgical theaters at the time were generally far away from the rest of the hospital, up in the top of bell towers occasionally, because in addition to people screaming before anesthesia, they smelled bad. Surgical areas smelled really nasty because of the almost inevitability of these kind of infections. And if you guys do any sort of a rotation or residency at a hospital that has a really old hospital portion attached to it, try to find out where the original surgical theaters were. And I bet if they go back into the 1800s, they're actually going to be pretty far away from the main area. I think uh, Ohio State, one of the anatomy labs, is actually in the old surgical suite. And it's way up at the top of this you know, kind of vaulted ceiling building away from where people could hear people screaming and dying. So. Anyhow, so Lister figured out that there were different types of endomolecules, or what we'd call now bacteria, responsible for the different types of pus. And he immediately knew this was a big deal, and that you could deal with these things and deal with surgical infection. So he started looking for an antiseptic agent, and he settled on what was called carbolic acid, and we call it phenol today. Now, who's actually dealt with phenol in chem class? I mean, it's not a pleasant compound, but it's not exactly the most awful thing ever. But if you've been around phenol, you can understand it's not a pleasant substance to work with. And he would spray it on the instruments. They'd dip their hands in phenol. They'd spray it into the surgical wound. And it would actually sterilize things. And he started having very good results. No incidence of post-surgical infection. As a result, people not dying of sepsis. There was a bit of inflammation due to the phenol, but that paled in comparison to the actual benefit that people were having. So he promoted this finding and came up against a lot of resistance because it slowed down surgery spectacularly. Surgeons were really fast gunslinger type people. They wanted to get in, get out, do as many procedures as they could really quickly. And this slowed things down a lot. You had a little aerosolizing device that you'd spray phenol around the room in, you'd spray it in the wound, you'd dip your hands in it, that kind of irritated them, made them all beefy and red. It just slowed things down. But Lister, unlike a lot of the other people that we've talked about in the history of medicine, had an internal piece about him. He wasn't showy, but he was very insistent, but also very humble, very willing to let the results speak for themselves. So he kept on putting his results out where people had to deal with it. And funny enough, when people make a breakthrough, they're often most neglected in their home country, but thought more highly of elsewhere. And in Europe, various uh, military surgeons picked up on the importance of his work right away. And his work started getting more traction in Europe before it ever got traction in the US or in England. So one of his big opponents was someone in Philadelphia, Dr. Samuel Gross. And if you've ever seen this picture, this is called the Gross Clinic. It's actually named for the doctor. He was a really prominent surgeon in America, very well known, very influential, but he was a staunch opponent to the germ theory and Lister. He believed, as other people did at the time, that surgery needed to be quick because it was the oxygen in the air that caused the infection. He said it was because of the irritants present in the air that you had infection and therefore you had to be quick and messing around by keeping the wound open and spraying the stuff on it was just creating more trouble than it was worth. So he was very against it, very influential, and it took a while for Listerian technique to catch on in America. But Lister, again, persevered with a great deal of humility, but also insistence that he knew he was onto something. And he had demonstrably superior outcomes, and it was validated for that. He kept on promoting it. And sadly, one of the reasons things move forward and progress is that the older opponents of something like this die off. They retire, they go away and they're no longer standing in the way of these insights. So antiseptic methods eventually came into being. So instead of trying to sterilize things in the surgical field, you could use an autoclave, steam them, get them to kill off any infective material ahead of time, and just have an aseptic environment rather than antiseptic. Now, before we go on, one quick thing is uh, Pasteur actually got to meet Lister. And Pasteur, in a rare a show of humility said that if his work had done nothing else but inspire surgical antisepsis, that it would have all been worth it. So they were both very 
keen on each other's work and very appreciative of how they'd each taken germ theory in different directions. So we're going to move into America now because we've already jumped all around Europe, into the Middle East, back into Europe, through Scotland, into England. We skipped over France and Germany a bit, although there were some surgical innovations there. But in the early 1900s, American surgery really took off, and you get a little patriotic swelling of pride for the next, next little while. Don't worry, I'll pepper all that unbridled patriotism with some horrible stories as well, so don't worry. It's still me talking. But the big name in American surgery was William Halstead. And William Halstead essentially created modern surgery and created the modern surgical method of teaching. So he was born in New York, and he was very upper class. He was born into a very wealthy family and didn't seem to have a real propensity for medicine or anything, really but eventually started training in medicine and really caught on to it. And he really liked Lister's methods, and he was exposed to them in Europe. American medical education at the time was pretty, I'll be charitable and say it was uneven. To be less charitable, most of it was junk, and the people who had the means would get a degree and then immediately go travel Europe to see different hospitals, different clinics, and try to adopt the best of actual European surgical and medical efforts because that's where real good work was being done and then bring it back to the states. So he became aware of Listerian antisepsis and used it extensively. His hospital didn't want to pay for it. So being of independent means, he actually got a tent put up on the hospital grounds and had an antiseptic theater put up in that tent so they could actually work there and use phenol to keep people from getting infections. He did a lot of writing, a lot of anatomy, research, a lot of research on uh, nerve blocking, use of anesthesia. And he was really, really active. And it seems like he was working all the time. He had a cadre of colleagues that they were just working nonstop, writing, going out and partying, just really burning the candle at every possible end. And was just headed to the top of his field as this lightning, lightning bolt of a human being. But then something bad happened. He was going into topical anesthetics. Instead of anesthetizing the whole person, maybe there was a way to numb a limb and do surgery on the limb without knocking the whole person out. And what was the topical anesthetic at the time? Cocaine. So cocaine was all over the place. Kids got a toothache, have some cocaine. Throw some heroin in there for good measure. Kid won't cry anymore. These things were completely unregulated, and you could just buy cocaine, experiment with it, take it, use it medically, no one cared. And Halstead began using cocaine, investigating how it could numb peripheral nerves to do surgery. And he and his friends discovered something. They felt really good after they were injecting themselves with cocaine. And they could stay out late, and they could write, and they could keep going and going and going nonstop. Cocaine had actually entered medicine through Sigmund Freud. Freud had worked on the medical activities of cocaine, trying to figure out ways it could be used to bring people off of heroin. That was actually a big thing, was trying to get people off of other drugs by giving them cocaine. And he recommended that a guy named Carl Kohler, have I talked about this already? Not, not this time. So Carl Kohler was told by Sigmund Freud, yeah, you might check this stuff out for ophthalmology. It might do some good work. Kohler was an ophthalmologist, and he had done a lot of work in removing cataracts and doing eye procedures. And just for a minute, imagine trying to do an eye surgery procedure of any kind on someone who is unanesthetized. Like, you can strap down someone's arm or their leg, but how do you stop their eye from moving? So he took these cocaine drops, put them in people's eyes, and lo and behold, you could cut into the cornea, go into the lens, do stuff to the iris. You could actually do things to the eye without people experiencing the pain or having the inadvertent withdrawal reflexes as a result. So this was a massive step forward for ophthalmology. And going off of that, Halstead decided to work on peripheral nerve blocks as well. Problem is, he and his friends all got addicted to cocaine in the process. And in trying to write up his results, he crashed hard. Most of his colleagues crashed hard. Several of them died due to the effects of the drug and withdrawal. And I don't want to read this out, but just take a moment and read this. This is the paper he finally wrote on the effects of cocaine in surgery. This is when this is sim symptomatic of him crashing out. 
That's a sentence. Try to read that. I'd try to narrate it, but it's just painful. This took him months. This took him months to write. So obviously, he was completely strung out, incapable of working, and basically lost his practice and was left adrift. The good news, I'm going to move on now in case anybody hasn't finished, is that he had a good friend, a guy named William Welch. And William Welch was the first uh, professor of pathology at the brand new Johns Hopkins University. And he took him in gave him a position as a laboratory assistant to try to help him get back on his feet. And Halstead slowly became an incredibly good surgeon again, but a very different one. Instead of working quickly and being this just lightning bolt of activity, he was very slow. He was very meticulous. But it was said that when he did surgery and did experiments, they were almost bloodless because he was so meticulous with cautery and tying off vessels and making sure that everything was very, very perfect. So they took a great deal of time, but they were incredibly effective. And he started researching different surgical problems. So he kept on looking at new problems with his very meticulous techniques. And when the chair of surgery for Hopkins didn't show up, he was put forward for it and became the first chair of surgery at the brand new Johns Hopkins University. And these are the four, or medical school, I should say. These are the four founding faculty members at that school. And Halstead is standing up there right behind the table. So think about some of the anatomical illustrations we've had thus far. These are actual drawings of Halstead's detailing how he would go about treating hernias, doing thyroid surgery. These were things no one had ever done well. He actually understood ways that you could use the anatomy to fix the abdominal wall so that the guts wouldn't herniate out. Thyroid surgery wasn't even a thing before he came along because any damage to the thyroid would cause what they called thyroid storm, where the hormones would enter the blood, cause a massive metabolic activity, a massive metabolic reaction, and people would be in real trouble. He did the first successful, what we'd call modern gallbladder removal, on his kitchen table on his mother because she had a massive attack of her gallbladder, and he knew what was going in. He knew it was going to kill her. So with his, uh, I believe it was his brother and his sister holding their mother down, he cut her gallbladder out in an emergency gallbladder removal at home. He worked on intestinal ligation, figured out how to actually bring intestines together, ligate them in such a way that they'd hold, and different look, aneurysm surgeries. He just looked at every possible thing and based it in proper anatomical technique. Now, one of the things he's known for most infamously these days is the Halstead radical mastectomy. Now, it's a very, very invasive procedure. But at the time, standard of care for breast cancer was this illustration. You gave them some opium. You stuck spikes through the breast attached to ropes. You pulled up on the ropes to put traction on the breast, and then you cut it off with a hot knife and then applied cautery. Now, those of you who know anything about lymphatics, how's that going to work? So not only have you not cured this person, you've horrifically maimed them. This very uh, calm appearance to this woman's face does not ring true for me. So essentially, the surgery at the time might have removed some of the ulcerative lumps that would develop on the breast itself, but did nothing to deal with metastasis because people didn't know anything about metastasis. That changed with Halstead. He did detailed anatomical investigations of the lymphatics of the breast and figured out that by the time people came to the doctor with breast cancer, it was usually pretty far advanced. So his method was to remove the breast, remove the pectoralis major and minor, remove as much of the lymphatics as possible in the process. Now, this is an illustration of his method. This actually worked, and it took a disease that not only killed people, it killed them in a very painful way, killed them and socially isolated them because these sores would get uh, septic, they would smell bad, they would keep people locked in. And even though this surgery is now considered to be very, 
pretty much unnecessary unless there's very, very advanced spread, it was a big step forward at the time. So a lot of times people revile this technique as being very brutal, but you gotta put it in context. It was a huge improvement at the time, and now that we have better understanding of lymphatic spread, better, especially better screening to catch these tumors before they're ulcerative and massive, you don't need the Halstead radical mastectomy so much. But that's just a pretty clear example of what he did to improve surgery, based it in solid anatomical investigation, and actually saved people and made their disease treatable. Now, all that would be great, but he didn't stop there. He created the modern surgical residency. He had students come in after their education, and basically the seniors trained the juniors. Then they would shift up the totem pole. Seniors trained the juniors. More seniors trained the other seniors. And you have the chief resident up at the top. And anytime you go into the anatomy lab and put on a latex glove, you can thank Halstead. Up until now, everything's been uncovered. Just your hands in there. He invented the surgical glove, actually talked to the Goodyear company because uh, his surgical nurse had a real reaction to the phenol that they'd used to do antiseptic technique and her heads, hands would swell up and be painful. So he came up with the idea of getting her some rubber gloves. And once she had them, everybody else wanted them too. He actually later married her. Her name was Carolyn Hampton. But uh, yeah, the gloves were one of his innovations as well. Now here's the thing. The surgical residency was really a big step in forward educationally, but it was a necessity for him because he would just disappear sometimes. He would just disappear for weeks at a time. He'd just wind up at his wife's country estate. She was also relatively wealthy as well. And so they'd be like, where's the chief? Well, he's gone. Okay, resident, you're up. And they'd have to be ready to take on any surgical problem that was on there at a moment's notice because he would just disappear. And the reason he disappeared is that he didn't quite kick the cocaine habit as thoroughly as we would like. He mostly kicked cocaine by getting addicted to heroin. So it didn't come out for years until after his death. Uh, William Osler, another luminary at Johns Hopkins, wrote, it's, he was a hilarious guy, but he wrote what he himself called the secret history of Johns Hopkins. And he detailed things like the fact that he was still addicted to heroin and occasional cocaine benders and would just disappear for weeks at a time in, a, in order to you know, let that run its course. And so the surgical residency allowed the hospital to keep working with qualified surgeons even when he was away. And who are some of the people that he trained? When you get into surgery, there's gonna be a huge list of people that he trained that founded various other schools and types of surgery. Two of the big names, the people who invented modern neurosurgery, Harvey Cushing and Walter Dandy. So Harvey Cushing really got along well with William Osler, that other, the medicine teacher at Hopkins. They didn't, he did not get along well with Halstead. He found him very aloof. Halstead tended to have a very sarcastic and biting sense of humor and would kind of mock his residents to their face occasionally. And Harvey Cushing didn't really care for that. But he was also a very meticulous operator, and he took neurosurgery from 90% mortality to about 8% by the time he retired. Now, when you hear Cushing's disease, does anybody know what Cushing's, uh, Cushing's is? What's it a problem of? Oh, good. Well, I was going to say adrenal cortex. It's your adrenal glands, but it's due to the pituitary gland. He figured out a way to do pituitary surgery. He figured out a way to cure trigeminal neuralgia. Now, trigeminal neuralgia, for first years, you haven't heard about this. Any second years want to tell me what trigeminal neuralgia is? Are there any second years in here? Going once? Twice? Dr. Morris Wyman, have you ever heard of trigeminal neuralgia? <laughs> Just a little. She's our local expert on it. That's my little joke. So trigeminal neuralgia is massive pain associated with cranial nerve 5 facial pain that's debilitating. And the most common outcome of trigeminal neuralgia without treatment is suicide. Because not only does it, is it painful, it keeps you awake. And when you've been awake for three or four days, you make bad decisions. So trigeminal neuralgia, he was able to treat by actually cutting branches of the trigeminal nerve. And it numbed part of the face, but it stopped the pain. There are better or typically better treatments available these days. 
But this is the first time anyone had actually gone to the brain and figured out that you could actually do something to fix it. Now, another student of um, Halstead's was a guy named Walter Dandy. And Dandy and Cushing had a pretty cool relationship. They didn't get along. They were really rivals. Dandy more so than Cushing. I think Dandy saw himself as Cushing's rival. Cushing didn't really see himself as Dandy's rival. But he did a lot of interesting stuff, mostly to establish his name. He figured out how CSF circulates and how that can result in hydrocephaly when it goes badly. He came up with aneurysm clips and how nucleus pulposus can cause sciatica. So this was all something that he described and tried to come up with ways to treat. One thing I think is amazing, we don't do any more. But keep in mind, these guys were doing neurosurgery, and they would occasionally have to go into the cortex. They would have to operate based not on nothing more than a very thorough neurologic exam. So if you think the tumor's here, you better know that, because there's no way to take an MRI. There's no way to visualize it before you actually open the skull and go in. So they had to have a very thorough understanding of how to read the uh, neurologic signs to know where to operate. They still had trouble visualizing tumors inside the brain, and Dandy came up with something really amazing. It's really clever. We don't do it anymore because it's horrendously invasive. But to visualize the ventricles, he would actually go in and drain the CSF out, have them filled with air, then take an x-ray, because we did have x-rays, and that would actually allow him to have contrast between the ventricular space, which was now full of air, and the rest of the brain, and sometimes visualize where a tumor was located as a result. So again, we have better methods now, but at the time, big step forward. So they took these neurologic processes, tied them to where the dysfunctions would be, and were able to come up with surgical interventions as a result. Now, Johns Hopkins stays front and center with surgical innovation in the United States. And the next thing is going to be heart. Brain surgery actually preceded heart surgery, because the heart has to be operative the whole time you're using it. And before you could bypass the heart, it was really difficult to do anything to it without actually killing the person. So heart surgery was considered something that was very, very suspect, very, very avoided, because it was just thought to be something that was a fool's errand, and you're going to make yourself look bad, make your hospital look bad by attempting it. Helen Tossig was not a surgeon. She graduated from Johns Hopkins, got an appointment in the pediatric department, and eventually a fellowship in pediatric cardiology. There was a little bit of sexism associated with that, because her whole career she'd been told, no, no, go into public health, women shouldn't be doctors, even though Hopkins will let you be. Then she got out of Hopkins, she was like, oh, okay, well, go, go hang out with these children and, you know, listen to their hearts, it'll be fine. And she took the opportunity that she was kind of shunted into and really ran with it. She consulted another woman at McGill University in Canada named Maud Abbott, who was an expert on congenital abnormalities of the heart, especially pediatric hearts, and she really got a sense of what heart malformations were like. She had a fluoroscope that she could actually use to visualize the flow of blood in the heart and come up with ways to diagnose where the problem was. But at the time, you were basically helping mitigate the symptoms of these problems, there's nothing you could do to fix children's hearts. You just had to make them comfortable until they died. She didn't think that was acceptable. So she decided to look at ways to actually fix the heart, and the method they came up with was to correct Tetralogy of Fallot. Now this is the picture that's often shown of Helen Tossig, and this is actually a very staged picture, because she couldn't use a stethoscope. She was almost totally deaf. But yet she had to figure out where murmurs, clicks, things like that were going on in her pediatric patients. And you guys should all take note, she did it by touch. She palpated those murmurs. She palpated those little clicks, those little valvular stenoses and things like that. So a bar's been raised. <laughs> Feel free to palpate any murmurs that you come across out there. So she was really, really good, really attuned to her patients, but wanted to find a way to help fix their actual problems. So she was listening with her fingers, and she eventually wrote a book that founded the entire field of pediatric cardiology. And it went through several editions during her lifetime. And she was very, very influential. However, it still took her another 20 years to get full professor at Hopkins. So opportunities for women were there, 
they weren't quite as extensive as we might have hoped. And we'll talk more about that in our next talk as well. But let's go into what the actual procedure was. She consulted with the chief of surgery at Hopkins, a guy named um, Alfred Blaylock. And Alfred Blaylock was an incredibly skilled surgeon. He had done work on surgical shock following World War II and essentially how the blood vessels respond to shock, how people can die due to that low blood pressure. And one way that they did that was by rerouting the major vessels coming out of the heart to create a uh, hypovolemic situation and study shock that way. They figured if you've got someone who's having difficulty getting blood to the lungs in the first place, maybe you could create an artificial ductus arteriosus. Helen Tosig had thought about this because her patients who had tetralogy of flow and a patent ductus arteriosus, a channel between the aorta and the pulmonary arteries, did really well compared to other tetralogy patients. But when that ductus arteriosus closed, they quickly had really bad cyanotic spells and would often die. So she thought maybe we could create an artificial ductus that would allow blood to bypass the stenotic area of the heart and get to the lungs. So she consulted with Alfred Blaylock, and he was okay with it. And Blaylock had one other thing that no one else had at the time, the best surgical assistant in the world. So he had a guy named Vivian Thomas working for him. Vivian Thomas was uh, black. He was, uh, wanted to be a medical student, but the bank that he kept his money in had crashed. There was no savings insurance at the time, so his money just disappeared. So he was working at Vanderbilt with Blaylock, and Blaylock quickly recognized that this guy had excellent hands, was an excellent surgical tech, and pretty soon, Vivian Thomas was doing all the prep work and all the research on surgical interventions that Blaylock would then try to put into a human model. So they got to work on solving Tetralogy of Fallot, and they were able to actually get um, the procedure to the point where it would work. Now, a young girl who was about Oh, she was, I want to say three years old, but she was very, no, not three years, she was not even a year old, and named Eileen Saxon, was on the wards, and she had taken a turn for the worse, and they said, if we don't operate, she will die. She's a good candidate for this procedure. And so she was scheduled to have that done. Now think about this. The first heart surgery, and surgery on these major vessels coming from the heart, is going to be done not on an adult, but on an infant tiny, tiny little vessels, tiny little heart. Secondly, they had figured out how to do the procedure, but Blaylock, the chief of surgery, had not done one himself. So in Baltimore in the 1940s, a very racially disparate time, this procedure was first done, and Blaylock insisted that Vivian Thomas, his black laboratory assistant, had to be not only in the surgical theater with him, but actually directed the operation. He was on a stool standing over the chief of surgery, like, no, no, don't cut there. No, no, pinch that off. Okay, suture there. And it worked. And they said, the people who were in the room at the time, said they weren't sure if the procedure had worked until they released a clamp. And the little girl, who was blue as scrubs, some of you guys are wearing scrubs, good job. Thanks for helping me out, suddenly turned pink. And so that was the birth of the actual ability to do heart operations. And lots of people started getting that procedure done. Once the heart-lung bypass machine came along, you're actually able to stop the heart and actually directly repair the, de the defect and then restart it. So that was how heart surgery actually came into existence. And essentially, that's taken us up to where we are now. We've got improved surgical methods, but we've pretty much used that same idea of stopping the heart, pumping blood through it and oxygenating it, taking the lungs and heart offline long enough to actually go in and directly repair it. So this is Alfred Blaylock on the left, Vivian Thomas on the right. And if that uh, story was at all intriguing to you, there's the uh, picture of the operation happening. Vivian Thomas is standing in the back, kind of looking over the shoulder of Blaylock. And there's a really good movie that HBO did called Something the Lord Made. And it's got Alan Rickman and Moe's Deaf. So go check it out. You will cry. I'm going to warn you right now. But if you want to see uh, Professor Snape affect a southern accent, then you know, you're, you're in luck. <laughs> it's kind of surreal to see, but it's fun. So where do we go from there? 
we can actually operate on various organs now. But sometimes the organ, due to the disease process, might not be one that you can repair. You actually have to remove it. And unless you can replace it with something, you're not going to be able to succeed in keeping your patient alive. So transplantation was the next major leap forward in surgery. Kidney transplants between identical twins had been done in 1954, and it worked, and he got the Nobel Prize for that. At Stanford, a guy named uh, Richard Lower and Norman Shumway were working on heart transplantation, and they'd gotten it to the point where it was feasible, but the problem was immune rejection. Rejection was not a phenomenon people knew much about. Immunology was very much in its infancy as a field, and people didn't really know how to deal with this rejection phenomenon. So they were working on it, and they were really shocked when a former student of theirs in South Africa, a guy named Dr. Christian Bernard, did the first successful human heart transplant in Cape Town. Now, we say successful in quotation marks there because the patient didn't live very long, just a couple weeks. But the couple weeks was enough to generate interest, and pretty soon they were able to refine the procedure, and more and more people were getting heart transplants and staying alive for longer periods of time. However, the rejection phenomenon, because they couldn't really tissue match people at the time, always kind of became a problem, and the procedure fell out of favor because the long-term results really weren't what people wanted. But Shumway, back in Stanford, had started looking at cyclosporin, looking at ways to make the immune system not reject the transplanted organs. And once he was able to get cyclosporin and immune system suppression along with the heart transplant, people started living longer. And heart transplantation and other organ transplantation really took off. And in fact, it's incredibly frequent now. These days, the surgery and the immune suppression is not the problem. It's finding enough donors to actually give the hearts to the people who are going to need them. OK, I jumped ahead a little bit there. So by 1984, we had more than 300 transplantations done with good survival rates. And now it's mostly a matter of fine tuning the techniques. Instead of a heart transplant, maybe you do a heart lung transplant. But working with the individual organs and fine tuning the techniques is now the issue. And the biggest issue is finding enough donors to make it feasible. But what if we don't need donors anymore? What's the next step? Regenerative medicine, actually creating new organs from the stem cells and the, do the donors themselves. You don't have to worry about immune rejection if you're able to grow an organ from someone's own tissues. And this takes us up to the current day. This is still an ongoing uh, area of active research. But in 2006, at Wake Forest, a lab-grown bladder was transplanted into a kid with spina bifida. This kid had a bladder that was de-innervated due to the spina bifida, and the smooth muscle of the bladder was tonically contracted. So it was just unable to expand. So they were able to go in and grow, well, not grow, pardon me, they took cells from the kid's bladder and painted it, and literally painted it onto a scaffolding of collagen. No, it should not be a scaffolding of collage. Sorry. <laughs> you could maybe combine collage and paper mache with organ transplantation. But essentially, they were able to create this scaffolding, paint the, own, the, the, the recipient's own epithelial cells onto it, and create a lab-grown bladder, complete with a layer of smooth muscle, a layer of epithelium, and connected it back up to the kid's ureters, and it worked much better. A lab-grown trachea, shown there, was grown in 2011. So that once the scaffolding is there with D, kind of a, fibers that are kind of decellularized, so they don't mount an immune response, you can paint living tissue onto it, keep it alive in a growth medium, and then transplant it along with sufficient blood supply. That's it for right now. And I should have removed this slide. Uh, the Amazon book list that I put together has disappeared. So I'm trying to get a kind of proposed reading list out to you guys later. But that takes us to the end of surgery and really up to the modern era. We've talked about the history of medicine in the ancient world, up to how disease was conceptualized and how the changes in disease were seen as time went by and science developed then into the differences in treatment medically, and now the differences in treatment surgically. The next and final talk is going to be looking at
really kind of the black mark on medicine, but also science and culture in general, which is we spent millennia excluding people, deliberately excluding people from the practice and contribution to medicine, and how that process is only now getting addressed and hopefully getting mitigated so that we're not turning down talented people who are able to contribute to medicine and scientific development. Thank you.